protected under a Creative Commons copyright notice. Part 2. Models of Self-Directed Learning The consensus in the adult education literature is that self-directed learning is a process that most adults engage in. Malcolm Knowles, the most well-known adult educator of the last century, stated that self-directed learning was nothing less than, uh, quote, basic human competence, the ability to learn on one's own. Indeed, many adult education theorists believe that the ultimate goal of any adult educational experience should be fostering the ability of a learner to become more self-directed. Since the early 1970s, a number of researchers have offered models for understanding the self-directed learning process. Miriam and all have categorized these processes as being linear, interactive, or instructional. In this video podcast, we will take a look at characteristics of linear and interactive models of self-directed learning. The instructional models which focus on how an educator might teach someone how to be a self-directed learner are discussed in more detail during another video podcast. As discussed in the first video podcast in this series, the University of Toronto's Alan Tuff conducted the earliest formal research into self-directed learning. His research found that 70% of all learning projects undertaken by adults were planned by the learners themselves. Tuff defined a learning project as, quote, a highly deliberate effort to gain and retain certain definite knowledge and skill or to change in some other way, end quote, and required that, quote, learning sessions must add up to at least seven hours, end quote. His research suggested a linear stage process through which learners progress towards their goals. Malcolm Knowles, who included self-directed learning in his conceptualization of andragogy, also argued for a linear stage process. Knowles's six steps for self-directed learning are climate setting, diagnosing learning needs, formulating learning goals, identifying human and material resources for learning, choosing and implementing appropriate strategies, and evaluating learning outcomes. Noel suggested a number of resources for teachers and learners to facilitate each of the steps outlined above. The concept of a learning contract, for example, might be familiar to some of you. Although there is some intuitive appeal to a linear, stepwise process to engage in self-directed learning, a number of theorists have argued that learning is more complex than the linear models allow for. These so-called interactive models of self-directed learning allow for the fact that a variety of factors, internal and external to the learner, might have an effect on the nature and quality of a self-directed learning experience. The first such model was proposed by Speer and Mocker in 1984, and it focused on how learning was shaped by the environment, what they referred to as, quote, organizing circumstances. Philip Candy also recognized the importance of contextual environmental factors in the early 1990s and has continued his work into this century, now focusing on the nature of out online learning and its relationship to self-directed learning. Candy notes that, Quote, the boundaries between online learning and other life activities are becoming increasingly indistinct because technologies are becoming seamlessly woven into work, leisure, shopping and banking, social activities, and other domains of people's lives. End quote. And, quote, the blurring of boundaries between entertainment on one hand and education on the other may prove to be one of the defining convergences of our age, with dramatic implications for both domains, but particularly for education. End quote. The implication is that self-directed learning, particularly with the age of digital technologies, may change the degree to which people engage in learning projects, particularly when it comes to creating new collaborative knowledge. Clay Shirky has recently highlighted the phenomena of cognitive surplus, the combination of free time and access to digital tools that many people now have, which enables them to use digital technologies to create meaningful results from self-directed learning projects, particularly in groups online. Evidence for cognitive surplus and people's willingness to use digital technologies in their spare time for creative content is evident in sites such as Flickr, Wikipedia, and YouTube. Stepping back from the specific implications of self-directed learning processes online for a moment, we should consider Candy's original model. He articulated the following four dimensions of self-directed learning. Personal autonomy, which is a personal attribute. Self-management, the willingness to and capacity to conduct one's own education. Learner control, a mode of organizing instruction in formal settings, and autodidaxy, the individual, non-institutional pursuit of learning opportunities in the natural societal setting. Candy also suggested that the nature of learners' self-directed learning processes might be different in different content areas. The Personal Responsibility Orientation Model, or PRO, proposed by Brocken and Heimstra, take, take account of both the goal-oriented personality of the learner, 
quote, a learner's desire or preference for assuming responsibility for learning, end quote, and the process of self-directed learning, quote, in which a learner assumes primary responsibility for planning, implementing, and evaluating the learning process, end quote. Their comments about the process of self-directed learning is similar to what Knowles and Tuff described, but as Miriam and all note, the notion of personal responsibility, quote, is that point of departure for understanding their con- concept of self-directed learning, end quote. The PR mo- The PRO model is grounded in the idea that humans risk to achieve their potential. The model also recognizes the importance of contextual factors in self-directed learning. In my view, one of the most promising models of self-directed learning is described by Randy Garrison, who viewed self-directed learning from a collaborative constructivist perspective, which, quote, position between the more extreme radical and social constructivist positions requires that the individual taking responsibility for constructing meaning while including the participation of others in confirming worthwhile knowledge, end quote. By worthwhile knowledge, Garrison invokes the ideas of John Dewey, who believed that both cognitive and social concerns need to be deeply integrated in order to be, quote, personally meaningful and socially worthwhile. Garrison's model uses the following three overlapping dimensions. One, self-management. Two, self-monitoring. Three, motivation. And in motivation, we're talking both about the initial motivation to begin an experience and the motivation to stay on task. Garrison was quick to point out that it is difficult to consider the dimensions independently because there's considerable overlap between each of the concepts. The self-management dimension is most familiar in the sense that it refers to the learner taking some control of all aspects of the learning situation so that they can achieve particular goals. The simplest example of the self-management dimension is the practice of giving learners some choice over how they would like to proceed. Garrison notes that, quote, questions of goal management, learning methods, support, and outcome are collaboratively and continuously assessed and negotiated. It is important to note that the idea of giving more control to learners does not necessarily mean that the learner does whatever he or she wants, independent of learning context or interactions with peers. In fact, quote, educational self-management concerns the use of learning materials within a context where there is an opportunity for sustained communication. Self-management of learning is an, in an educational context must consider the opportunity to test and confirm understanding collaboratively. The first dimension of Garrison's model focuses on the process of self-directed learning and is thus linked to the implications of of self-directed learning for teaching. The other two dimensions focus on the cognitive aspects of self-directed learning. A critical underpinning of the cognitive dimensions is that it is, quote, difficult to get learners to accept responsibility for meaningful learning outcomes when they have little control of and input into the learning process, end quote. The second dimension, self-monitoring, quote, addresses cognitive and metacognitive processes and is the process by, whereby the learner takes responsibility for the construction of personal meaning, end quote. Cognitive processes are those that enable learners to use particular strategies to achieve their goals and objectives. Metacognitive processes are those that monitor the degree to which cognitive processes are being successful. One useful way of thinking about metacognitive processes is to define them as thinking about thinking. Learners who have more developed metacognitive processes are better able to monitor their personal responsibility for learning and to seek out external feedback when necessary. As Garrison said, quote, to be aware of the internal and external input and to use it to construct meaning and shape strategies is to self-monitor learning cognitively and metacognitively, end quote. Self-monitoring, cognitive and and metacognitive responsibility is inextricably linked to the management of learning process. The final dimension, motivation, is a crucial dimension of self-directed learning. It is not hard to imagine that unmotivated learners are unlikely to assume responsibility for their own learning. Motivation is an enormous field of research in of itself, and a comprehensive review is not possible within the confines of this video podcast. But we all do have an intuitive understanding of what motivation means. But for purposes of this discussion, we'll use Garrison's definition. Quote, motivation reflects perceived value and anticipated success of the learning goals at the time learning is initiated and mediates between context, control, and cognition responsibility during the learning process. Put simply, the motivational dimension is the mediating factor between the self-management dimension and the self-monitoring dimension. Garrison further broke down the motivational dimension into motivation for beginning a task, entering motivation, and motivation for persisting in learning learning activities and goals, or task motivation. 
Now, motivation to enter a particular learning experience is determined using uh, Wigfield and Eccles expectancy value theory, which is an interaction between the expectations one has for personal success based on both personal and contextual characteristics and the value one places on, on achieving a goal on both personal need and effective state of being, uh, effective state of mind. Garrison notes that task motivation, the ability to persist on a learning experience, is related to volition, which is it's essential for directing and sustaining effort toward learning goals. Many researchers have argued that volition is a key element of success in education. Garrison's model is quite robust and it takes into account a number of cognitive and metacognitive factors as well as the transactional orientation towards teaching and learning that is the goal of many adult educators. Although contextual factors are, in theory, accounted for by the three dimensions his model has been criticized for, not explicitly considering uh, contextual factors of self-directed learning in a structured way. This criticism seems particularly valid given the ways in which learning experiences have been affected by digital technologies. In this video podcast, we took a look at several models of self-directed learning. Although the earliest efforts were linear models, self-directed learning is now conceptualized as an interactive process between a number of factors, including both internal cognitive and metacognitive processes as well as external, often institutional, structural factors that can support learning. Creative Commons Copyright Notice this work by Dr. Sean Bullock is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 3.0 Unported License. You are free to share, copy, distribute, and transmit the work under the following conditions. 1. Attribution. 2. Non-Commercial. 3. No Derivative Works. This license may be viewed in its entirety at the web address listed on the screen. Thank you.